My name's Barb Zivkov, and I work for MIPS Technology Incorporated at Silicon Graphics, and I'm here to talk about the R4200, also known as ICE and also known as VRX, which is a low-power, low-cost, MIPS R4000 compatible microprocessor um, focused at portable computing and embedded applications. The talk is going to take place in three parts. First, I'll talk about the objectives of the R4200 program. The second part, we'll go over key features and how we were able to reach our goals. And the last, we will compare ourselves to other microprocessors. The R4200 program was somewhat unique in that our main objectives were to design for low power and small die size. And designing for low power would allow us to fit into a low cost plastic package. Also, a small die size would allow us to reach high yields in manufacturing, which would keep the cost down. But within those constraints, we also tried to maximize the performance. And our goal here was two times the performance of the Intel 486DX266. We also considered that integer performance was more important than uh, floating point performance to our target market, so we concentrated on integer performance. We also wanted to make sure the design was modular, meaning that we would be able to encourage derivatives, and we wanted to keep the design compatible with the R4000 and R4400. This is a floor plan of the chip, and its features very quickly are unified floating point and integer data path, 16K iCache, 8K dcache, both of which are direct mapped, virtually indexed, and physically tagged. 32 entry TLB, each entry of which maps two pages. And the operating frequency of the chip is nominally 80 megahertz internally and 40 megahertz in the system interface. And the power dissipation is estimated at 1.5 watts on average. So how did we design for low power? First of all, we designed the chip for 3.3 volt operation. We didn't design to five and lower it to three. No, it's, it's optimized 3.3 volts, so it operates best there. We also organized the caches in banks and implemented the data cache as a write-back cache and also implemented an instruction cache prefetch buffer. And these three points I'll go over a little bit more later. We implemented an instruction micro TLB, which holds the last two instruction translations and reduces the contention for the joint TLB, resulting in decreased power and increased performance due to decreased number of stalls. And we unified the floating point and integer data paths, as I've alluded to earlier, and I'll also talk about that in more detail later. We added some power management capabilities, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So what are these power management capabilities? The first one is known as reduced power mode. And typically what happens is that an external logic will initiate this reduced power mode. And it will, for example, write a bit in the status register in an interrupt handler. And this will divide the clocks by four, meaning the internal pipeline clock will operate at 20 megahertz and the external pipeline clock at 10. And this will lower the chip power dissipation to 0.4 watts. All this can be done and no sacrifice to functionality. All of the instructions are available and you can still do useful work. The second power management capability is called instant on-off. And in this, the R4200 resources are all software readable and writable. This means that external logic can initiate a power down sequence in which all registers, and by registers I mean the general purpose, the flowing point, and the system control registers, can be written out to memory and the both caches can be flushed, and this can be done in a matter of milliseconds. At this point, the chip can be powered off completely, reducing the power dissipation to zero, and then at some later time, the chip can be turned back on and the state can be restored by loading the caches and loading the registers. How did we achieve low cost? And by low cost, I mean that the volume price is estimated to be near $70. NEC, who is our semiconductor partner, will be setting the price for this chip. We did this by making the chip um, with a very small die size, and that's 76 square millimeters. By doing this and lowering the power, we are able to fit into a plastic 208-pin quad plastic quad flat pack package, which we call the R4200 LP package, and it's a very inexpensive option. 
We also designed for high yields by using only conservative di design rules and not pushing the technology. And we are targeted toward a high volume mass production technology. It's a very mainstream process. It's 0.6 microns, three layers of metal, and two layers, layers of poly. And it doesn't use any exotic technology such as flip chips or pads on top of logic. Here's the performance that we were able to achieve. We got 55 spec int 92 and 30 spec FP92 when simulating with 256 kilobytes of secondary cache. And with no secondary cache, we achieved 50 spec int and 20 spec FP, 28 spec FP92. Um, the system interface can sustain data rates of 160 megabytes per second. And the primary cache miss is a very low latency operation, which in which improves our, um, improves our performance quite by quite a bit since we have very few stalls other than primary cache misses. And the reason we were able to do this is that we have no state machine penalties for on-chip multiprocessing or secondary cache support since we don't have on-chip support of secondary cache or multiprocessing. This means that by the time a miss is detected in the instruction cache to the time that the processor read request is sent out to the system interface bus is only three pipeline cycles. It's a very modular design, meaning it's easy to increase, decrease, or delete completely the caches. It's also easy to increase, decrease, or delete the TLB. And it's also easy to change the system interface. And all these together mean that it's very easy to offer the chip core as a mega cell and generate derivative designs such as uh, embedded applications. And we did all this without sacrificing R4000, R4400 compatibility. By this I mean that we implemented the full MIPS 364-bit instruction set at the user, supervisor, and kernel levels. And the system interface that we chose is also compatible with the R4000 and 4400 system interface protocol. We also offer a compatible packaging option, which we call the R4200 PC. That's a 179-pin uh, ceramic PGA, which is pinout compatible with the, the R4000 PC and R4400 PC packages. So what are the key features of the chip? And how were we able to meet our goals? We basically took a very hard look at the design resources that we had to work with. And the next slides will talk about the specific features that we, we use to decrease the power consumption. These are a traditional risk pipeline, large on-chip IND caches, a unified data path, and focused subset of configurations with respect to the R4000 and R4400. And I'll also present the vital statistics for the R4200 chip. First of all, we implemented a very traditional risk pipeline. It's a five-stage pipeline. The, the stages are the instruction cache, register file read, execute, data cache read, and register file write back stages. And we decided not to implement a superscalar design since we, we actually ended up decreasing the parallelism, parallelism with respect to separate data paths by combining both the integer and floating point data paths. So obviously, superscalar was not an option for us. We also decided not to implement a super pipeline machine since we wanted to decrease the stalls as much as possible and simplify the control as much as possible, which would lead to low power, small die size, and a low cost chip. Because we have this five stage traditional risk pipeline, we're able to have only one branch inter, only one branch delay slot, and that is architecturally defined by the R4000 architecture. This means that above this branch delay slot, we have no branch interlock or penalty. And a five-stage risk pipeline, we found, is more efficient at low clock frequencies and dissipates lower power than either superscalar or super pipeline design. We implemented very large on-chip caches. As I said before, it's 16K instruction cache with an eight-word line size and an 8K data cache with a four-word line size. Also, as I said before, they're both direct mapped, virtually indexed, and physically tagged. 
implementing the data cache as a write-back cache reduces the system activity, meaning there's less switching at the I.O. pins and less power is dissipated. We also implemented the cache data arrays in banks, in four banks each, and the two most significant bits of the index select each bank. A cache line lives in only one bank, meaning on a cache access, only one bank is active at a given time, and this cuts down the power dissipation of the caches substantially. We also added an instruction prefetch buffer between the instruction cache and the pipeline. It's a buffer which holds two sequential instructions, and on any iCache access, the desired instruction plus the one following is fetched and put into this instruction prefetch buffer. And this cuts the iCache access rate by almost a half, although on any branch or jump, the cache will be accessed regardless of whether or not the branch is taken. We added redundancy in the caches to improve the yields. These are redundant columns which can be swapped in by blowing polyfuses if a uh, defect is detected in the cache data array, and this increases our yields. We also implemented the caches with four transistor RAM cells. One of our major features is that we unified the data path meaning that we share functional units between the integer and floating point operations. For example, a, there's only one carry propagate adder in the data path, and it performs both mantissa and integer operations. There's also only one physical register file in the data path, and only having, having both the floating point and integer register files in one physical register file cuts both the decode and the control logic although logically they're both implemented as two separate. We implemented the full 64-bit MIPS-3 instruction set. And by unifying the data path, we were able to get only a very small die, which will result in low cost, and less die area than separate data paths, resulting in lower capacitance and lower power dissipation. The cost is that floating point and multi-cycle integer operations will stall the entire pipeline. And in order to get around this a little bit, we, we implemented variable latency floating point operations, which provide a small performance boost to the floating point. And these, there are two cases for this. If by examining the operands, you can detect that you're going to be taking an exception, for example, a floating point divide by zero, then the floating point operation will execute for only two cycles, and then it will enter the exception handler. If also you can determine a result, a trivial result, merely by looking at the opera operands, for example, if you have a non-zero floating point number multiplied by infinity, you know the answer is going to be infinity, then that infinity will be supplied in only two cycles, as opposed to the relatively long multiply time. And then the pipeline can resume all its normal work. This slide talks about the variable latencies, and the, the columns are the instructions that we're talking about, 32-bit integer performance, 64-bit integer performance, single precision floating point and double precision floating point. The last four rows might need a little explanation. That's a convert operation between double precision and single precision and back, and also from floating point to integer representation back. And the first column in the floating point columns will give you the trivial and source exception latencies. The second column is the full latency. We also offer only a focused configuration with respect to the R4000, R4400, which means that we deleted some features that we felt weren't necessary for our target markets. We offer no on-chip support for external secondary cache and no on-chip support for multiprocessing. We also cut the number of page sizes that we support in the TLB to only two, and those are four kilobytes and 16 megabytes. This decreases the TLB die area since we only need one bit to represent the TLB size or the page size. And as I mentioned before, we felt our target market didn't need the full range of page sizes. We also fixed the cache line size for both of the caches. The instruction line size is eight words and the data cache line size is four words as opposed to the R4000 in which they're, they're programmable. All of, removing all of these features, or cutting them down at least, 
enabled us to save die size, power, and design time, and also helped with the verification effort since it cut the number of modes that we had to verify. Here are the chip vital statistics. As you can see, the die size is very small at 8.8 .8 millimeters by 8.6 millimeters. As I mentioned before, the process technology is a 0.6 micron, three layer of metal and two layers of poly. The clock rate is nominally 40 megahertz externally and 80 megahertz in the pipeline. In reduced power mode, that decreases to 10 megahertz externally and 20 megahertz in the pipeline. The transistor count is 1.4 million transistors, about a million of which are in the caches. The packages I've talked about as well, there's a 208 pin plastic quad flat pack, which is a very inexpensive option, and that's known as the R4200 LP. There's also a 179 pin ceramic PGA, which is a pin compatible option with the R4000, and we call that the R4200 PC. The on-chip buy cache is 16 kilobytes, as I said, and the data cache is 8 kilobytes. And on the chip, we've integrated the CPU and the floating point, the instruction cache, data cache, memory management unit, 32 entry TLB, micro TLB, graphics flush buffer, which allows us to have non-blocking stores and dirty cache miss write backs, and also the power management capabilities that I alluded to earlier, which are the reduced power mode and the instant on-off capability. The supply voltage is 3.3 volts, plus or minus 10 percent, and the power consumption is below 1.5 watts nominal and 0.4 watts in reduced power mode. The next two slides are the really fun ones where we compare ourselves to other processors. As you can see, we're a very inexpensive chip. The only less expensive chip than us is the Hobbit at $35, but as you'll see on the next slide, we have much higher performance than they do. Also, you can see that the 4060X266 is about the same die size, but as you'll see on the next slide, we also have much better performance and we are at a l much lower cost. As far as performance goes, if you compare us to the, R, uh, to the Intel 486DX266, you'll see that we did indeed get at least close to 2x the performance, but we're at a much lower cost. And if you especially look at the uh, dollars per spec int 92 numbers, you'll see, if you divide that out, you'll see that the Intel 486DX2 costs $15.60 per spec int 92, whereas we cost only $1.30 per spec int 92. And the spec int 92 per watt numbers are equally as impressive. We have 36 spec int 92 per watts, where the 4062DX 486DX266 has only 4.6. A uh, NEC executive was known to say that, that we were aiming for Pentium performance at a tenth of the cost, and I believe we came at least close to achieving that. The next slide is a die plot photograph. There's not much to explain here. And before I finish, I'd just like to acknowledge the effort of the ICE team. We were a very small team, and we were able to turn this chip around in a very short schedule of 18 months. Thank you. Thank you.